ever had somebody that was just a challenge to work with, maybe a supervisor, maybe just one of the other staff members? What difference does emotional intelligence really make in these relationships? We're going to answer that question today on the Church Revitalization Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfurs Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. My name is Scott Ball. I'm joined as always by my friend AJ Matthew. And today's episode is brought to you by Faith Street. Faith Street is an iOS and Android app that helps to bring your congregation together between Sundays. It helps to prompt mindfulness, reflection on your teaching, prayer requests, dialogue, fellowship, all these kinds of things that are so important for building discipleship as a habit. And we really want you to check them out and see if it's a good fit for you to try to get your your church relying less on Facebook and more on a tool that is built by church leaders for church leaders. So check out faithstreet.com forward slash Malfurs and get 20% off. That's faithstreet, F-A-I-T-H-S-T-R-E-E-T.com forward slash Malfurs, M-A-L-P-H-U-R-S for 20% off. Check it out. AJ, emotional intelligence, it's... uh, it's important, but just how important is it? And I, I'm excited about talking about this today. Yeah, we've touched on this on one or two previous episodes, and um, I think it's becoming more prevalent in the, in the space for sure. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. we don't give it probably you know the credit that it deserves in managing relationships and leading well. So you know, yeah. I know that's why it's important to us to you know return to this sometimes and talk about it. And uh, yeah. today, I think this is a good, we're going to talk four points today on, on the importance of emotional intelligence. I'm going to go ahead and give a plug for Aubrey's book, Developing Emotionally Mature Leaders. Um, today's uh, kind of points that we are talking about is right out of chapter three in Aubrey's book and in our show notes at malfordsgroup.com slash 87. This is episode 87. Uh, there'll be a link there where you can get the book, but... You can also get the expanded list. There's actually 15 points um, in this chapter. We're just going to talk about four of them today. So definitely go over to the site and read about the rest of them. It's a free read of one of the chapters of the book. Yeah. Um, You know, AJ, I think that um, Patrick Lencioni talks about how at the organizational level, there's an assumption that if we're just smart enough as an organization or, you know, have this really innovative product or whatever, or in the church space, you might say, you know, we're really uh, innovative and sort of on the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of ministry, that that's going to be enough for us to to grow and make an impact, right? But he, um, Lencioni talks about how really you should just assume that you need some level of smarts in order to survive, and then what the real advantage is in organizational health. And obviously we spend a lot of time talking about organizational health, Malfurs mm-hmm. Group. And we spent obviously lots of episodes talking about organizational health. This is sort of mirrored, but at the individual level, there's this, you know, being a smart leader matters and we want to see you be a smart leader, but your smarts as a leader are only going to take you so far. And there's a, a huge component to your success as a leader that relies on your relational health, your emotional health. And, and, and without that, AJ, you're just not going to succeed long term. You may be, have these moments of greatness mm-hmm. that are ultimately sabotaged by poor emotional intelligence. And so in our points today, we want to emphasize sort of four things that can be hangups and why emotional intelligence is so important. Yeah, let's go. Number one is unemotional numbness. And yeah. as individuals, we might certainly either be this person or interact with this person. And that's one that simply has sort of cut emotion off in all of their interactions. They're not really feeling it. Mm-hmm. Now, in this particular paragraph, these none of these are, are long points in, in writing whenever you whenever you go to malfordsgroup.com slash 87 and read it, um, these are just short paragraphs that Aubrey has written. 
Um, but he, so he, this, this emotional numbness, it, he's really relating it more toward, towards maybe a reflection of a, an emotional numbness in our relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. And which certainly would affect our relationships with others. And so, you know, that's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. Not that it always would be that case. You might be emotionally disconnected from other people, but be emotionally connected to Christ. I don't, I'm not saying that can't be the case. Um, but are we, are we as leaders and, and are we able to recognize this in others? Are we tapped into the emotional side of our salvation and our savior and um, a lot, Scott, a lot of times this might even bring up into the conversation, get into a, a theology of emotions that Aubrey talks about later in the book also of God, the emotions of God even. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, think, I think when we start talking emotional numbness, it's helpful to reconsider God's emotions and being made in his likeness to also have those emotions. So, you know, I mean, such as, love and anger. I mean, there's some very explicit emotions discussed in, in scripture that, that God has that we obviously share with him. Yeah. I think there's a couple of factors at play there's, um, what we're really trying to get at here is there's a, a perception that good leaders are unemotional and that's just not true. You can't yeah. look at Jesus's leadership or look at you know, the sort of the portrait of God as a whole in scripture and see a, the, the person of God as someone who is unemotional or stoic. And so there is a, mm -hmm. a false narrative that that good leadership is is just here and feels nothing or yeah. doesn't reveal what what the leader feels. And so I think there are a couple of cult, couple of factors that contribute to this. One, as you've mentioned, is is theological perhaps we have a wrong theological understanding um, and you can obviously refer to the book it, there's a whole chapter on a theology of emotions um, but also there's cultural factors at play aj most not all obviously but most people who go into to ministry at this point um, in the world are still male it's still a male dominated um, situation and men generally are taught to sort of su suppress your feelings don't don't be vulnerable don't share how you're feeling or what you're what's going on and um what this causes often is actual uh a lack of awareness of what we're actually feeling and that's not good so it's counterintuitive i'm certainly not encouraging anybody to just start weeping on stage on a Sunday morning every Sunday, <laughs> like, like there's these major shows of emotion, but to be in touch, to, to be aware of one's emotions. What am I feeling in this moment? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? To be able to discern between the kinds of emotions that I have, which again, I think the book does a good job of sort of outlining yeah. the different kinds of emotions and how sometimes we can be emotionally confused. We can think that we're feeling one thing, but we're actually feeling something else. Um, a, a simple example of this, uh, AJ, we'll I'll go to Dollywood. We live relatively close to Dollywood for all of our listeners who are jealous. So sorry. I do have a season pass to, uh, to, to Dollywood. Um, but my kids will say this ride is scary. This is something, this is scary. Well, there's a very fine line between scared and excited, right? That, that that physiological sensation of being excited and the physiological experience of being scared are are razor's edge and so i'll often try to convince my kids it's like no 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 no, no. you're not scared you're just excited <laughs> <laughs> but but uh fear and anger aj are are physiologically very similar so sometimes we might think that we're angry but we're actually afraid and so being numb to our emotions is not healthy on a personal level. It's not theologically accurate. It's not good for our leadership. All it does is make us dumb in regards to our own selves. Yeah, this is big. This and Aubrey does a, a really good job of talking about your own emotional awareness. That's sort of what we're getting at here then with this emotional numbness point. Um, not, th not, not that you necessarily need to express emotions constantly, as you just said, Scott, but you at least need to be aware of your emotions 
because that will affect your decision making on maybe the next word that's going to come out of your mouth or or the way you're going to handle a situation or or a conversation. So absolutely. All right, emotional yep. numbness. There we go. Let's move on to number two, Scott. And that's misplaced motives. Misplaced motives. So um, yeah. you know, getting this is this would require you know a certain level of introspection. Um, or investigation, if we're in the context of somebody else, but for yourself, um, introspection on what what is really driving you, and mm-hmm. you know the question that that Aubrey is sort of asking in the book might even go down to um, a ministry call. What what why did you think you wanted to be in ministry in ministry in leadership? Um, uh, so, you know, making sure that, that, um, motives, I don't want to say pure or pure or impure, but that motives are, are right and not self-serving, but, you know, looking to it could, again, we're talking about context of the church. I mean, you know, your motive for being a ruthless CEO of a large corporation. Great. You can, you can have a different motivation, but motivation for being a leader in the church, um, would be different than than that other example yeah um our our motivations matter and oftentimes we're not even aware of this goes back starts with a personal awareness but um the book talks about to and i actually i told aj off air i'd love to do some um, individual episodes on these sort of emotional disorders that that um exhibit themselves in leaders from time to time. We've already talked about one bef- uh, before in, in the case of narcissistic leadership as an example mm-hmm. of the motives not being quite right. When the motives are not quite right, you end up manipulating people or gaslighting people or um, only caring about s- sort of your the adoration for you and the adulation from people around you. Uh, and so that misplaced motive can lead to poor choices. And, you know, it, I, I experienced a call to ministry when I was young. I was in, I was in middle school when I first felt like I wanted to get into serving, serving the church. And, um, so it's really easy, you know, as a, as a grown man to just kind of rely on that call and go, no, I had a really clear call without ever really checking back in with myself to, to check motivations on individual things. So we're not trying to discredit anybody's call, but toxic leadership doesn't happen usually from as a starting point. I don't think that most leaders get into church leadership and start toxic. I think they start healthy and move toxic because their motivations are never checked and they're never re-examined. And so it's important, I think, to go, why am I... When I start to get upset because someone's not agreeing with a decision I want to make, why am I upset? Is it really about the vision? Is it really about the mission? Or is it about me and my ego and my attitude? But those are questions that we have to be asking. Mm-hmm. And it yeah, impacts our leadership. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, even recently, you know, I know uh, we've had examples of, of uh, leadership team members that um, you could tell that they, they felt threatened. And so... If you're, Mm -hmm. if you're in touch with your emotions and you're thinking to yourself, the direction that we're going here, I'm feeling threatened by that. Then you certainly need to go back. That would go back to a motive question and go, what, what is going on with me? Um, you know, and, and consider the whole situation. So, yeah. Right. And depending on your personality, when you start to feel threatened, you may, you may act on that in a different way. So again, I don't want to get into all the details of this because I really do want to save them for their own episode, but you, you could either if you have narcissistic tendencies, when I, you feel threatened, you're going to bend that direction to start trying to manipulate people or the situation um, through coercion or, you know, charisma or whatever. You know, whereas if you're more of an S type leader on the disc, you're probably going to express that through being passive aggressive. You know, so it just depends on how you're hardwired, how those mode, those feelings that you have that if you're not in check with them, they're going to you're going to act out in ways that are not healthy in your leadership. So it absolutely matters to your day-to-day leadership for you to be in check with how you're feeling and what your motives are, because it's going to express itself in how you lead, lead people. Yeah. 
All right. Well, our third point today, I think this is this one is in particular is really good at answering our question of what differences emotional intelligence make. And Aubrey refers to this as teamwork glue, that healthy <laughs> emotional awareness and emotional intelligence and healthy interactions with others is the glue that makes the difference between an effective team and an ineffective team. And I, I think he's spot on. Um, Scott, We've worked with churches in which the leadership teams really interacted well together and, you know, really felt like a team. Then we've worked with other churches in which, mm, yeah, not really sure. I don't really know what you're doing. Not sure I care or others that just weren't really engaged. And, yeah. and then you can, you can watch the trajectory variance between those two, the delta between those two on uh, who's probably going to um, perform better on the implementation phase. And, um, and you know, this is a pretty relatable thing. I, most people have gone through some phase of career or life in which, man, it was great working with that person or that team, that group. Gosh, we did a lot of great work and we had a good time doing it. And it was just really great season of ministry versus another time in which you're like, oh, I kind of, you're, I'm dreading then that, that next meeting or maybe even just going back into work. And, um, yeah. And that emotional connection, a positive emotional connection in the, in a teamwork situation just makes all the difference. It really, really does make a difference when you're lucky and when you're fortunate, when you're blessed, you know, the, the, the teamwork just happens, you know, everyone likes each other and there's a sense that we're all working together towards a common purpose, but we don't always as leaders walk into situations where that natural camaraderie has happened. Mm -hmm. And so this is the role that leaders have to play. When I walk into a situation where, where things have not naturally gelled, how can I motivate and move the team and manage the emotions of the team? So um, actually, uh, Aubrey has this great quote from uh, Daniel Goleman, who, who wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence that I also recommend. Um, and uh, Goleman uh, in... Malfors says, the glue that holds people together uh, in a team and that commits people to an organization is the emotions they feel. And this is the key point I want to highlight here. How well leaders manage and direct those feelings to help a group meet its goals depends on their level of emotional intelligence. So um, we actually talked about this, I think, in episode 45, sort of the levels of leadership, um, levels of emotional intelligence. So you can go back and look at that. But the first two problems we talked about, AJ, have to do with awareness of your own, um, your own emotions. Mm -hmm. the, this idea of teamwork is the next level up of emotional intelligence, the mm -hmm. ability to be aware, not only aware, actually, so this is like level two and three. So not only aware of your own, of your emo emotions and aware of the emotions of other people, but then the ability to manage other people's emotions yeah. which is a very difficult skill aj to because that means you have to manage your own emotions first mm -hmm. you have to have some amount of control over how you're feeling yeah and behaving and not be manipulative there's a, would be a fine line between managing yeah, other's emotions sure. and manipulating others emotions yeah <clears throat> yeah but it's a it is a skill that you can develop you know, it's not like IQ. Goldman actually does a good job talking about this. If you listen to him or read him, you know, IQ is one of these things that's more or less set almost from the time you're born. Um, you don't, there's not a lot you can do to improve your IQ. Now, in fact, there's nothing really you can do to improve your IQ. It is what it is. But EQ is different. You you can, that's a, it's a skill you can grow and develop in. And yeah. so that ability to, to see see the room and the team aj as what it is and the emotions of the people and be able to see how can i navigate this situation is a real skill um it is an important one that leaders have to learn yeah you know i mean that in particular that quote there from goldman really made me think about this even at the marriage level and that might be more relatable for you know if you're if you're married one if our listeners are married um but this is a skill that that participates in successful marriages, really. You know, I mean, if you're able to be aware of your spouse's emotions and in particular, he said, 
that how well leaders manage and direct those feelings to help a group meet its goals. Well, if you could replace that with a, a marriage or a spouse meet their goals, that's what makes a healthy marriage, right? If, if, you know, I'm, if I'm focused on my wife succeeding, being emotionally healthy and achieving, you know, the things in her life that she wants to achieve. And likewise, we're both focused on the other or in the context of a team, if we're focused on our team and our teammates, then that raises everybody's level. So, you know, I think this is yeah. a really relatable point. Teamwork glue can also be marriage glue. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Point number four, our last one here is about two emotional extremes. So the point that Aubrey's trying to make here that I think is important is that you can, you can, uh, people tend to operate naturally in one of two ways, either, um, the emotions absolutely control, even if they're unaware of it, their app, their emotions control their decision-making or people sever themselves from their emotions in their decision making and neither of those extremes is healthy as we've kind of been talking about so um when your emotions are hijacking your decision making how that tends to express itself is um actually not making a decision aj um uh aubrey calls this empathy on steroids in the book so if you're too concerned about how a decision is going to make other people feel you'll just be paralyzed and not make a decision. Uh, but likewise, if you cut yourself off from emotion and don't care at all how people feel, um, then you can bulldoze people and actually lose ground that way. So there, you got to find that healthy medium between the two. Yeah, basically he's defining, he's given us a continuum here, basically. So those of you watching on YouTube, get the visual of me holding my hands up with the sorry <laughs> podcast folks. But uh, yeah, so on one end, the emotions on steroids and on the other end, what he refers to as Christian Stoics. And, and basically what he's saying here is we've got to come into the middle here at some point yeah. or, you know, have a little bit of leeway within that center point to be able to be emotional when needed and not be emotional when needed. So um, yeah. managing, managing extremes um, as in the rest of life, right, Scott? I mean, you can take anything to extreme and probably is, it's unhealthy at some point. So uh, keeping, yeah. keeping a healthy balance of emotion is, uh, the, is the major takeaway there. Yeah, one, one kind of layer of complexity to this, I'd love to add if we can, it's not in the book, but I think the challenges of emotional intelligence have been compounded over the course of the pandemic because um, so much of our life has gone digital and it's so much harder to be emotionally intelligent virtually. Um, even just, again, if you're, if you're listening to the podcast, not watching it, here, I'm just going to peek behind the scenes for our, our YouTube viewers. I can't look at AJ if I'm looking, if I look at AJ on the screen, um, to, to AJ, it looks like I'm not looking at him. Mm -hmm. If I want to make eye con, I can't make eye contact with him. I have to look, I have to look at the camera, right? Yeah, that's true. And think about that. Think about how much of an interaction AJ is dependent on eye contact, being mm -hmm. able to read someone's eyes, what they're feeling. You know, all these things that we do in real life in terms of mirroring each other's, you know, um, how we're sitting and how hand gestures and, and things like that. You throw a mask on your face, you're, you're not, you're getting, you're missing half of a person's facial expressions. So uh, all of those things compound and make it even more difficult to be an emotionally intelligent leader, but it makes it all the more important to work at being an emotionally intelligent leader. And so, um, I just want to encourage you if you're listening to this today, man, buy, you know, um, we're not, we're not making any money off this, by the way. I mean, Aubrey, I'd say, I assume Aubrey does, but <laughs> AJ and I don't make any money off of it. You get, get a copy of this book. There's, there are several like bunches of assessments in the back, uh, in terms of appendices Buy Daniel Goleman's book. Um, he, I don't, he's not a believer, but, um, he did write a really helpful book on emotional intelligence. It's worth, worth, listening or uh, listening to on audiobook or reading invest some time in understanding this stuff it's going to make you a better leader we'll make you a better leader um 
And you know what? Relating to people, Scott, and especially in a virtual world that a lot of us still uh, work in, requires tools such as Faith Street. Oh, look at that. That I'm a is a, I'm a first pro, class Scott. segue. <laughs> look at you. Our, our listeners, I know right now, in their cars, they're applauding. Keep, hey, keep it at 10 and 2, people. That's good. Yeah, Faith Street. You should check them out. It's a uh, iOS or Android app that helps to facilitate genuine Christian community in a virtual environment. It gets your folks off of Facebook. It's got tools that are built by church leaders for church people. So check them out. Uh, faithstreet.com forward slash Malfers, 20% off. F A I T H S T R E E T dot com slash Malfers, M A L P H U R S. Man, AJ, that was smooth as butter, my friend. Hey, dude, 87 episodes. I've learned a couple things. <laughs> and you can read today's show notes at malfersgroup.com slash 87 and, uh, and read that chapter, chapter three out of Developing Emotionally Mature Leaders by Dr. Aubrey Malfers. And uh, which, you know what? I'm going to give a little quick plug here as well. We got some fun stuff coming up in regards to Dr. Malfers. I'm not, I'm, that's it. No more hints. Oh, look at that. Ooh, nice. Just I'm dropping, just dropping hints, man. <laughs> that's Drop. right. So stay tuned. Yeah. We'll be back with you again next week with episode 88 and beyond. Thanks for joining us. God bless you.